Is it true that there's nothing new under the sun? Can that really be true? Are we that cynical? Are we going to be that pessimistic? Or are we simply being realistic? Are we just telling it like it is? Is it true that there's nothing under the sun? Nothing new under the sun? I prefer to think that I'm just the guy of steady habits, living in the land of steady habits, Connecticut, the Constitution State. And here I am in the vicinity of the Hat City. Yes, the Hat City. Even though you can't see me, you can hear my voice. And whether you believe in the fact that there is nothing new under the sun, or I'm just the guy of steady habits, you can probably guess that if you see this spectacle of a mysterious object hovering in front of your computerized screen with the disembodied voice behind it, you can probably guess that it's Wednesday and that I am Malcolm Tent, the guy lurking behind the object, and that it is time for this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes, baby! Let's talk some tunes. Oy vey. Woo. My pal, Jenny DeSoto. Jenny in New Jersey. She's got the same birthday as I do, and she's tuned in right now. And wants to know if, uh, if Stetson was in Danbury. Yes, that is true. Stetson had a big old factory and assembly plant in Danbury. And there might have been others. I don't know. But I know that uh, Danbury for a long time was the Hat City. And that's why I talk a whole lot about my heavy metal fortified jug of Danbury tap because the good people at Stetson certainly did their best to make sure that, they, that the Danbury water supply was very heavy back in the day. Ah, but I'm still drinking it. I'm still here. It ain't killed me yet. And it is very important to stay hydrated. Whoa, it's also very important to catch my monitor there's a lot of action going on behind the camera right now. You can't see it. Maybe you can hear the voice of Harry, who just knocked over my monitor. Harry is sniffing around. Good old Harry the cat might be making an appearance any second now. He's sniffing my finger. He's rubbing up against my hand. This is all happening off camera. What do you guys think? Should I be proactive and just grab him behind... Uh, his little armpits and bring him on. Oh boy, there he goes. All right, now I'm going to have to grab him because he's raising hell. There he is. The cat of the hour, the cat with the power, too sweet to be sour. Our favorite, fine, ferocious, felicitous, fuzzy faced, fang faced, very friendly, feline friend, Harry the cat. Yes, there he is. Being as wiggly and antsy as he wants to be. Remember two live crew? Didn't they have an album called As Antsy As They Want to Be? Well, that would be this guy right here. And he loves being rubbed under his chin. Oh my gosh, look at that. He will, ho he will hold that pose for a very long time as I rub his chin. Has anybody ever noticed? I never noticed before, but Harry actually has kind of a red beard. Let's see if I can get him. I don't know. Be still for a second, guy. People, the people want to see your red beard. Can you guys see that? He's got a little patch of red that his one fang sticks out over, and that is that his one and a half ears protrude over. Very, very subtle fellow sometimes, at least in the looks department, he's very subtle. So here he is parked on my lap, and we'll see how long he lasts. Let us drink to Harry and his health. <clears throat> my good pal Mike Lesser, Mike, Normally hanging out in Vancouver, B.C., but Mike, uh, last I heard, was in Japan. Is this true, Mike? Are you in the land of cultural superiority? The land of the Proresu and the Gojira? Gamara? Rodan? Are you there? Are you in Japan? Speak to us. The people want to know. Let's see. It is true. Mike is watching in Japan. Wow. So what time is it? Like 7 a.m. over there? What? It's early in the morning, isn't it? That is real dedication to the craft. Uh, in Osaka, what time is it in Osaka, Mike? I love knowing 
who is watching, like Pear from Sweden is watching right now. I think it's about 1 a.m. in Sweden. Is that true? So we got 1 a.m. We got about 7 a.m. For me, it's 7 p.m. Who else is tuned in right now? And from where? Alan, you're in the East uh, Eastern Standard Time Zone, are you not? Oh, there's, there's the answer Mike posted earlier. 8.05 a.m. in Osaka, Japan. Wowzers. That is dedication. If we have folks tuning in from Arizona, like they typically do in a few minutes, it'll be about uh, 4 p.m. where they are. So Ted Talks Tunes blankets the globe. We cover all time zones. We represent all sorts of good musical taste. I'm very happy to be doing this now for several years, man, which is very cool. Very cool that you guys have kept this particular bloat, this, not the bloat, this boat afloat for such a long time. Cheers, guys. <clears throat> Whew. So yeah, let's see. Derek Giles is tuned in. He's in the Eastern Standard Time Zone. Let me tell you, I'm a busy dude. Malcolm Tent is a busy man. There are no flies on me. I've always got several irons in the fire. I've got things on the back burner. I got things on the front burner. I got things inside the stove. And if anybody saw my post earlier about my fabled kitchen full of records, you've seen true fact that I use my stove for storage. I don't cook with my stove because I'm a bachelor rock star, dude. I have a hot plate. There's no need to have a giant stove with all those burners and a great big old oven. I've got a hot plate and a toaster oven. And that stove makes a great shelf and the oven makes a great storage bin. So having said that, I literally have things on the front burner. I got things on the back burner. I got things in the oven. They all need to be tended to. But I always take an hour to do Tent Talks tunes for you folks. Every week, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live on the Facebook and it can be found archived on my YouTube channel. Just look me up, Malcolm Tent. S search the keywords, Dan Barry, Anti-Scene, Ultra Bunny, Trash American Style, etc., etc., etc. You'll find me, and you'll find it. So yeah, I've been busy, 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 busy. Oh boy, I've been busy. And today was a particularly busy day because I took delivery of not one, but two shipments of vinyl. Ooh, exciting vinyl. Relating, of course, to my label TPOS. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we check the mail, which is actually going to be the foundation of a large part of today's show, let's check the bulletin board. You can see it behind me. But I'm going to give you a guided tour of events coming up. And we're going to go, we're going to try to go more or less chronologically here. So let's see what we got. Well, the first flyer on the bulletin board, it's the smallest, but it's probably the most intense. And that is for Anti-Scene's 40th anniversary show. Yep, the boys from Brutalsville have been at it for 40 years, officially, as of October 1st. Oh, yeah. And in celebration of those 40 tumultuous Destructo years, Anti-Scene... The band who I play the Thunder Lumba with will be having a gala rock and roll blowout at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg, South Carolina. You can expect to see anti-scene alum from the past. There are many, 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 many ex-members of anti-scene. I'd say the odds are pretty good that you're going to see at least a few of them there at this show. You're going to see our fabulous opening acts, Sweet Georgia Brown and Joe Buck Yourself. You're going to be seeing performances by past lineups and, of course, the current ultra lineup. Malcolm Tent, Walt Wheat, Sir Barry Hannibal, and, of course, the unimpeachable president for life, Jeff Clayton, at the helm of the ship. So that's going to be something. Ground Zero, our home away from home, September 30th. <clears throat> and I've blown the chronology because there is an event happening before that. A larger flyer, but certainly no less intense, anti-scene opening up for fear. That's right, fear at the masquerade in Atlanta, Georgia. That's happening on June 22nd of this year. 
I'm pretty excited about that because the Masquerade is one of those venues that's been around forever. And I've only been there once, and that was to see a couple of acts. I went there to see Magna Pop and the Cows in 1992. So I haven't set foot in the Masquerade in almost exactly 30 years, and I've never gotten to play the Masquerade. So that's going to be really exciting for yours truly. And not only that, I get to share the stage with Fear, for gosh sakes. Fear we're talking about here. This is good stuff. June 22nd, lots of rock and roll. And if you look very carefully, some fanboy marking out. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. June 22nd. Right around the first day of summer. So it's going to be hot Lanta for sure. What else is going on? Well, September 22nd and September 23rd, my birthday weekend. You notice how it all comes back to me, kids? It all comes back to me. You know, it's Tent Talks Tunes. I'm Tent. I'm talking tunes. I've got these events. It all comes back to me. How sweet it is. September 22nd and 23rd, my birthday weekend, Jenny DeSoto's birthday weekend, John Coltrane's birthday weekend, Ray Charles's birthday weekend, um, Bruce Springsteen, whatever. It's his birthday, too. I don't care about Bruce Springsteen. But the devotional Devo fan gathering is occurring at the Beachland Ballroom in Cleveland, Ohio. Two days of festivities relating to Devo, things devolved, things devoted, and everything that is completely... D evolved. And the first special guest has been announced. DJ Lance Rock from Yo Gabba Gabba is going to be in attendance live at the devotional. So he, who even knows who else is going to show up to that thing? I'm going to be there. So if you want to come and uh, press the flesh in person, I will be there with plenty of flesh to press. So what else is going on? <clears throat> I got to drink a little bit of Walter. <clears throat> because the pollen is still thick here in the greater Danbury area. We got all kinds of stuff blooming. I was taking a walk through the neighborhood, and one of my neighbors who is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, had her degree in horticulture was telling me <coughs> ex exactly what is in bloom. I know lilacs for sure are in bloom, and I think, oh, I forget what else she said. She gave me a whole list of the different plants that are fully in bloom right now and spraying pollen into the air, <coughs> which means I've got like seven or eight different kinds of pollen right here in me lung and in me sinus, but I will not stop. You know why I'm not going to stop? Because i got more stuff to look forward to. I've been given to go ahead to uh, announce officially Profanatica upcoming United States tour. Yes, indeed he do. Starting July 14th in the aforementioned city of Cleveland, Ohio, going straight across the top to the Portland area, down the California coast, through the California and other deserts, all the way across the bottom part, and then up, finally, to Raleigh, North Carolina on August 6th. And you might say, well, why do I care about the Profanatica tour? Why is it a big deal for me? Why is it on my bulletin board? Because I'm playing bass for Profanatica on this tour. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed he do. I'm not. It's just another case. Yeah, another case of where I am not only a fan. I am actually in the band for this one. Three weeks on the road. That's three weeks on the road with Profanatica. And I've been learning the songs. I'm going to tell you guys right now, Profanatica songs are a bear to learn. They are rough and tough. They are tumble with a lot of potential for stumble. But I will not bumble. People say, Tent, you got to be humble. But I can't mumble. I'm working on it, guys. And it is my full intention, my strong intention. And if you're a hardcore kid, you'll get that reference. My strong intention to set foot on stage July 14th in Cleveland, Ohio, and nail that shiz. That's my mandate. That's my job. So I'm hammering it out, guys. Working real hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jenny DeSoto says to get some saline spray 
to clean the sinuses. You got anything that'll help clear my larynx? My larynx is always the problem. It's my, my sinuses are okay. I can breathe all right, but <coughs> I swear to God, it, <coughs> see, it clogs my vocal cords <coughs> and um, makes it difficult to yammer for an hour. Ugh. Hydration definitely helps, but I think I'm just creating this kind of like pollen mud in my trachea. So anyway, yeah, that's what's going on. And I'll mention too that it is officially out now. The Prophonautica Live album recorded in 1991. I was not in the band at this time, but I did roll the tape for this. And I edited it and assembled it and released it on my label, TPOS. It's right here. It's on a uh, fabulous black vinyl, which is appropriate since it is black metal. So mostly black cover, black vinyl, black and white labels. It's black. And um, I still haven't listed it on my Discogs page because I've been so dang busy. But if anybody out there wants one, talk to me directly and I will hook you up with original early raw recordings by one of America's premier and debut black metal bands. There's some, uh, you know, some controversy about whether they were the first or not. As far as I'm concerned, they were the first. I don't, I've never seen any convincing evidence to say that Profanatica were not the first black metal band in the States. So I'm just going to go ahead and say they were the first and um, let the internet scholars have at it. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, that's the bulletin board. And, oh, man, there's been so much going on. I uh, woke up today to find UPS and knock, knock, knocking on my door. So I opened up the door and uh, my UPS driver said, here you go. Started handing me stacks and stacks of boxes. Boxes that were about 12 by 12 by 12 and dense packed with vinyl. You might ask, what'd you get? Hmm, what was delivered? into your kitchen today. What would make Teresa Brewer say, come on in my kitchen? Well, I'm gonna tell ya. I got a few releases coming up and they're all very exciting. And the first two of them relate directly to what I was just telling you guys about. <clears throat> a couple of quite exciting events. Now I mentioned the Anti-Scene 40th anniversary one of my favorite things to do when I go to a gig, and I'll bet a lot of you guys can relate to this, and I want to see and hear an amen if you can relate to what I'm saying. One of the best things about going to a gig is going to the merch table and seeing what kind of exciting goods the bands have. And of course, you got your t-shirts and your cozies and guitar picks and, uh, in our case, knives and all kinds of great fun stuff, which I love. But my favorite things, my absolute favorite things to buy at the gigs are the exclusive recordings. And I should probably do a Tent Talks Tunes about that because I've picked up some awesome gig-only swag at various shows from a lot of bands over the years. You know, limited tour sleeves, um, live CD-only gig releases, um, all, just all kinds of stuff. Like, I just love that kind of stuff. So in an effort to sort of return the favor and let that boomerang come back around, we in the almighty anti-scene, who are firm believers in the merch table, we have cooked up a little special something that's going to be available only at the 40th anniversary show. Yes only at the 40th anniversary show. And I took delivery of a crucial component of that item today from my friendly, helpful UPS driver. I opened up the box. I looked at it and what did I see? Well, you might have guessed. I saw some vinyl. Delicious orange vinyl with special custom labels. The Trademark of Destructo, side one and side two. 
Now here's another thing for all you people out here who are uh, as wacky about vinyl. Who out there knows where the design for this label came from? I'll bet you some of you people recognize it. Maybe not the possum, maybe not the word destructo, but if you guys are serious, ridiculous record collectors like myself, you know exactly where I stole the label design from. Oh, yes. Orange. And orange, you glad that I also got them on blue. Look at that gorgeous, opaque blue vinyl. Also sporting the Custom Deluxe Trademark of Destructo labels. I am extremely happy with the way this came out. I think it looks great. I think it sounds great. And it is going to be available at the Anti-Scene 40th Anniversary Show. Yes, it's a gig only LP. How cool is that? I've been on the receiving end of stuff like that ever since I visited my first ever merch table. I'll never forget it. The first ever merch table I went to was at my first ever concert, which, as you may know, but it bears repeating, was Devo. That's right, Devo. August 1st, 1980 at the Guzman Cultural Center in downtown Miami. My first ever concert and my first ever trip to the merch table. I bought a genuine, honest-to-gosh, red plastic energy dome. And it cost me $6. <coughs> Excuse me. And for a young lad who hadn't started working yet, you know, I wasn't, on, I wasn't in the workforce yet. I was only 14 years old. Or was I 15? I forget. 14 or 15. I wasn't working yet, but... Um, you know, I, I had some lawn mowing money and stuff like that. So to lay out $6 in 1980 bucks was quite an investment, but I happily forked it over. And that was the very beginning of my merch buying career as a concert goer. Let's see, we got the uh, comments coming out. Nick Chalsula says that 1980 was his first ever concert, and it was also Devo. Nick, where did you see Devo for the first time? Because, as I just mentioned, mine was August 1st in Miami. Where was yours? Where was yours? Let us know. And by the way, Nick, stay tuned, because uh, the, next sh the next item I'm going to show directly, result directly relates to you. Now, Nick Chalsulo is the executive producer of The Devotional. This guy puts more blood, toil, tears, and sweat into it than anybody on this planet. And, at least in theory, reaps more satisfaction from it than anybody else on this planet. He can get satisfaction from the devotional. So everybody give a, a nice clap and a big salute to Nick, who is tuned in right now. He makes the devotional happen and has made it happen for a number of years now. So, Urgh. Adam Zisser is tuned in. Adam is another fellow who's very much in tune with his inner devolved self. Adam, you're going to be interested in this next item, too. Adam has been known to play on the stage at Devotional with Devo Tribute Acts. Oh, yes. You better believe it. So Adam saw Devo for the first time in 1988 in Atlanta. Right on, on the Total Devo Tour. I saw that tour at the Ritz in New York City in November of 1988. And uh, yeah, seeing Devo in a relatively small venue like that, that was pretty damn cool, man. Pretty cool. A toast to seeing Devo live, kids. <clears throat> so yeah, it's all about uh, what's all this yakety yak about concerning Devo and my UPS driver? Well, I seem to recall maybe a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, I don't even know. I think I might have done some show and tell on the jacket, the front cover for the Devoted LP. Now, there was a Devoted CD that we gave away last year to the first attendees through the door at the Devotional. And it was such a hit and caused such a ruckus 
that an executive decision was made by the executive producer, Nick Chalsulo, to go vinyl. To go vinyl. And I always say, go vinyl, go vinyl, go vinyl. So who was I to say no to having that momentous task assigned to me to help facilitate? Oh, yes. Nick says that he saw the total Devo tour at City Gardens in Trenton, New Jersey. There is an excellent recording of that show. I'm sure you've heard it, Nick. Killer soundboard recording of that very gig. Probably the best one from the whole tour. Best recording of the whole tour, I would say. And Nick, you were there. But I digress. I think I showed you guys the cover. That's the front. That's the back. That's the inside. A lot of great artwork put together by lots of hard-working spuds who are regulars at the devotional. The music contains performances by the Spud Boys and the Super Thing, the Devo tribute bands, and also Jerry Casali of Devo, David Kendrick of Devo, and Bob Lewis, founding member of Devo. They are all contained, well, I mean, they're on the cover, which is not that exciting, but the fact that my wonderful, helpful UPS driver showed up today with boxes of vinyl. It's a reality, kids. Devotional, exclusive release, Devoted, is on vinyl. It's here, it's now, it's wow. And you guys are going to get to witness the assembly of the first copy ever. Here's the vinyl. Here's the factory provided inner sleeve. Here's the jacket. Watch carefully kids like the French fry going into the donut. The first copy of the devoted album is now assembled. It is a reality. It just happened. And I'm going to repeat that operation 299 times over the course of the next however long it takes me to do it. And so if anybody uh, out there is so inclined to go to one of the the only actual full-fledged Devo fan gathering in September and pick you up one of them puppies... You are now welcome to, and uh, we'll, we, Nick, devotional people, will be making a full-fledged announcement about how to do it relatively soon. I have a feeling I've got a big, long conference call in my near future. Am I right, Nick? We're going to talk about the details of that, so it's happening. Yay! Happy, 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 happy. <clears throat> Now we have a note. It says that the uh, the wife of the executive producer is super happy that they went to my house and not his. I can relate. I can totally relate. Um, you've seen the pictures of what my kitchen looks like. You haven't seen the pictures of what my living room looks like. I don't mind working in the coal mine, but these days I've been living in a warehouse. So I will take a lot of satisfaction personally out of assembling these things and getting them into nice stackable crates and out of my kitchen, and out of my living room. It's cool. I live the existence, and that's fine. I signed up for this willingly, joyfully, joyously, and I ain't going to stop. I have no plans to ever stop. Releasing records, tapes, and CDs is in my blood. As the great T. Valentine would say, it's in my blood. So, yeah, it's just a simple matter of feng shui. i got to get all those cardboard boxes out of my living room. So my feng shui can flow. So it can flow properly. You people know what I'm talking about, right? Feng shui? Huh? It's important. Feng shui is very important. I'll stand by that statement. Woo! See, so yeah, I've been D, 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 details? Yes, Nick says details. Yeah, I've been uh, hard working, man. Ah, Mondo Braswell from the great city of Hickory, North Carolina, wants to know if I've heard about Josh Freeze 
playing with the Foo Fighters now. Dude can do whatever he wants. Foo Fighters, they're not Devo. Just saying. Just saying. More power to them. But they're not Devo. Shrug. Woo! So that kind of takes care of the mail call and the bulletin board. And I just got random stuff, man. I've always got stuff to talk about, man. And I love doing this with you folks because there are just so many objects. And objects are cool, you know? I really love objects. I love the tactile sensation of picking up a Profanatica LP, of holding in my hands the actual objects, such as a 1971 comic book. Yeah, yeah, comic books. That's got nothing to do with music, really. But I think a lot of you folks out there can relate to what I'm saying. We love to collect. We're collectors. That's definitely one of the, the motivations behind Tent Talks Tunes, is the collecting instinct. The fact that we love to gather. Um, hoard? Well, one doesn't think so, but, uh, you know, gather for sure. We just love stuff. I've been a collector my entire life. You know, my, my fir the, fir the first thing I ever collected was rocks. When I was a real little kid, I loved to collect rocks. And then after that, you know, collected coins, collected stamps, collected comic books, comic books, and then fully embraced collecting records later on. And the thing about my collecting of stamps and coins and rocks and comics was that there, there was always music going on in the background. I always had a record collection. I always had a radio <clears throat> record player of some sort in my room when I was growing up. So even if I wasn't like avidly collecting records, they were always there. Like all the way from, you know, oh my gosh, the, you know, the first rock and roll record I ever got, which was Grand Funk Live Album, to the first 45 I ever purchased with my own money, which was Disco Duck by Rick Dees and his cast of idiots. And, you know, before that, when my parents enrolled me in the Columbia House Record Club and I got records by Joe Cocker and Johnny Cash and Ray Conniff and um, the Carpenters, a lot of C's in that list for some reason. There were always records, always stuff happening in the background while I was doing my other collecting. <coughs> and so even though, you know, like vinyl's been at the forefront of my collecting mania for all these years, <clears throat> I just can't help picking up something like a stash of comic books when they're at a record show that I'm attending. Yes, I was at the record show in Maplewood, New Jersey this past weekend. My friends Charles and Jennifer Maggio host that. And uh, much to my surprise, delight, and maybe chagrin, there was a guy selling comic books. And they were... the kind of collectibles I like the best. They were cheap. They were cheap, cheap, cheap. As they say in Espanol, barata y segunda. They were cheap and used. In my collecting, and you know, if you guys have any feedback on this, I'm curious. My collecting has always been about getting the good stuff cheap. I like, for example, I'll just take this thing out the uh, holder. Yeah, it's very nice that the guy put it in a plastic bag with a board, but you notice I'm opening this sucker up right now my love of collecting is with the object. I'm going to read this thing from cover to cover. I mean, I'm going to read the incredible ad on the back for Sizzlers. I'm going to read all the ads in the middle for, you know, send us your songs, send us your poems. Oh, look, coin curios. Collecting, kids, we all collect. This, this comic book cost me a dollar. Cost me one dollar. And that's the way I love it. It's from my childhood. This predates my comic book reading by a couple of years, but I remember seeing these with the 15 cent cover price around. To me, these were antiques when I was a kid. This was published in 1971. I started reading comics in 74. When you're that age, three years is like a lifetime. So this was like antique stuff for me. So I still get a super duper chill when I find a comic book that I consider an antique for a buck. What's it worth? about a buck. It's probably worth about 96 cents, but I paid a dollar for it. You know what I mean? The joy is going to be in reading this thing and in reading this one. I read this one last night, The Submariner. 
Look at that two-dimensional art. This is what I love about these things. It's all flat colors. And it's all two-dimensional. And it's all hand-drawn. Everything about it, except maybe the rub-on letters in the corner. That's all hand, kids. Hand-colored, hand-drawn, hand-lettered. Totally flat. I don't even know what color that's supposed to be, but you don't you don't see colors like that. So I love these things, man. Fuck each. Now these two I actually had. I actually had Daredevil number 124 and 125. I bought them for a quarter each on the newsstand in 1975-ish. Paid a dollar each for them in 2023. That's how things go up in value. They were worth a quarter. Now they're worth a dollar. I'm going to read them. I love them. I seem to recall these were, these were kind of heavy storylines at the time. Daredevil versus the Copperhead. Ooh, good stuff. Good stuff. Had this one too when I was a kid. Doctor Strange. With an awesome piece of cover art by Gene Colan. I think Gene Colan is probably my favorite Marvel artist of all. That guy was amazing. All of his stuff was very dark. Like literally very dark. Lots of shadows tastefully applied. Gene Colan. I paid 30 cents back in the day for this copy of Fantastic Four, number what? 176. So I was happy to pay a dollar for it the other day, featuring the return of the Impossible Man. That's high drama. Defenders number 40, written by Steve Gerber. Steve Gerber's my favorite writer of all time. Steve Gerber is the guy who came up with Howard the Duck, The Man Thing, Omega the Unknown. And he had a really cool run on the Defenders. His stuff is very weird, very based in psychology, very based on cultural observations with a very wry and sardonic take on things. I don't know if he affected my way of thinking or if he just keyed into my way of thinking that was unrealized at the time. But what I can read Steve Gerber's stuff now and I, I really, really appreciate his point of view because it is jaundiced. And, you know, just some good old-fashioned superhero, wham-bam, get into a big old fight, huge explosions, Marvel team-up with Spider-Man and Yellow Jacket and the Wasp. Man, to me, this is collecting. Good stuff, cheap, that I can enjoy and get my hands on and read from cover to cover and keep out, kind of like this issue of Submariner, keep out of the containers. Because they are here to be enjoyed. And I'm going to enjoy them. That's a little bit of a detour away from tunes into comic books. And one of my many, 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 many manias. A big toast to many, many manias. Ah. <clears throat> Callie Hellstrom says that he has all the later issues of Defenders once Son of Satan joined. Who wrote those issues, Callie? I, I had a bunch of those myself, but I don't remember who wrote them. I just know that, um, you know, Steve Gerber put his own thumbprint on it. Um, Nick Chalsula wants to know, do I have any interest in Incredible Hulk mags from 35 cent days, average Keodone condition? Yes, I do. Because I was still buying lots of comics from the 35 cent days, and I made every single one of them into a kid-owned conditioned comic book. And there were some pretty good storylines from those days. I don't know if I can remember any specifically, but... Um, by that time, Herb Trimpey was off the books, so the, the artwork had improved. And that was before John Byrne took it over. So I don't recall exactly, but yeah, 35 cent era, that's good stuff, Nick. Nick, make your wife happy. Get those comic books out of your house and put them into my house. I got room in my oven for them. No prob, dude. No prob whatsoever. I got room on, the, on top of the stove, too. I'll take them all, dude. Whew. Yeah, yeah. Boy, a lot of action going on here. People talking about comic books and stuff. Ralph Ferrara says that he had Daredevil number two once and his mom threw it out. Yeah, no, that's cool. I had, uh, I had Fantastic Four number one back in the day. And I sold it to finance my move to Connecticut. Do I kind of regret it? Yeah, kind of. But, you know, I'm here now. That, that investment certainly paid off. Whatever I got for it at the time, which was not a whole lot. I remember, this is a true fact, I paid 75 bucks for that issue of Fantastic Four number one. And I paid for it on the installment plan from a place called Passaic Comics in Passaic, New Jersey. 
and um, I believe the payments were seven fifty a month, and I paid for it over a period of ten months and took delivery on it, and um, yeah, it was cool. It was a cool thing. I had Iron Man number one, Iron Man number three, Avengers number seven. I had a lot of really awesome Marvel Silver Age comics. Um, they all had to go. You know, when you're moving from Florida to Connecticut, you got to jettison all the dead weight and turn it into convertible cash, which is what I did. So, yeah, I miss them, but I'm glad I'm here. Very glad I'm here. Let's see. Mm hmm. Well, Ralph's got some uh, sad stories, but we're not going to go into sad stories. We don't do that on Tent Talks Tunes. We're all about the rock and roll. We rock and roll all night and party every day and read comic books after the rock and roll. That's what we do. So I got a few minutes left. I want to do some show and tell of some stuff that I'm, I'm definitely getting rid of. I mentioned before, I think last week, <clears throat> that as some of you may know, I had a, uh, a long run as a radio DJ on WNHU in West Haven, which for a very long time was Connecticut's number one college radio station. I'm not going to put forth any opinions that I have about WNHU's current condition. Let's just say that I don't DJ there anymore. And as a result of my no longer DJing there anymore, I got a ton of records that I kept strictly for radio play that I don't really have a need for anymore. It's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. I played nothing but good stuff. My radio shows were all hand-picked. It was my ear that listened to all that music and filtered it through my brain and broadcast it out over on 88.7 for quite a few years. But the thing is... I'm not doing the radio anymore, so I got tons and tons of dang records that I just am never going to listen to again. No matter how good they are, I'm just not going to listen to them. So I've been going through the old personal collection and calling all this stuff. And it's all going to end up for sale. And just to give you a couple of teasers, some really cool stuff. And this is going to really stretch your memory banks or stretch the knowledge that you have or the love you have of certain genres. Anybody here remember the June Brides? Great mini album. There are eight million stories by the June Brides. When I hear the June Brides, I always think of like an early kind of prototype version of the wedding present. You know, maybe with a little bit less vinegar, but very, I think these guys really plowed the field for the wedding present. And I dig it. You know, it's really cool. It's got that distinctly English... Not like jangled pop, but definitely guitar-driven pop with a hard edge to it. Really good stuff. I'm just never going to listen to it. This is going to be for sale very soon on my Discog store. Unless anybody wants to make me an offer before I put it on Discogs. This is typical of the dozens of albums that I am divesting myself of. Because I just don't have room for them in the home anymore. I was almost going to keep this one. I came so close to keeping this one, but I said, you know what? The same rules apply. I'm never going to listen to it. Last week, I talked about some of my favorite English eccentrics. Guys like Ivor Cutler, um, John Cooper Clark, and one of my favorite New Zealand eccentrics is Peter Jeffries. This guy does everything right. Super intelligent, top-shelf musical chops, I had the pleasure of playing some shows with Peter Jeffries uh, around 1996 when he was in a group called Two Foot Flame, and he blew my mind. The instrument he played was the piano drums. You might ask, what's a piano drum? I'll tell you in a minute. <sighs> Hold on. Time out. Grant Den who was in the original version of Broken Talon about a million years ago, wants to know if he should go see Tommy James and the Shandells on Saturday. Why wouldn't you, dude? Why would you not? Why not? Do it. Go. 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 Go see Tommy James. I owned a, I owned a Tommy James cassette when I was very young, and I liked it a lot. So my vote is for yes. I vote yes. Anyway, Peter Jeffries with Two Foot Flame, was playing piano drums. P 
piano drums blew my mind. He had a regular drum set that he sat behind with a piano to his left by the hi-hat. And so he played drums with his right hand and his right foot and played piano with his left. So he was playing, and the guy's a percussionist. I believe he teaches percussion at a university somewhere in New Zealand now because he's a New Zealander. So he's playing very tasty drum patterns with one hand and very tasty piano riffs with the other. And he did that all night for the whole set, the whole duration of Two Foot Flame's set. Dude, I just sat there and watched him all night. And Two Foot Flame were a really good band. It's basically Mecha Normal, the two folks in Mecha Normal with Peter Jeffries. So, you know, and Jean is a riveting front woman. But I couldn't help but watch Peter Jeffries play those piano drums all night. And, um... <laughs> excuse me, that actually helped me make my decision a little bit er easier for getting rid of the album because I have my memories of Peter Jeffries, my very personal memories of Peter Jeffries contained on this cassette right here, which has also been released on CD. This is by the Bunny Brains. It's called Hoop Soundtracks. This is one of the last shows I ever played with the Bunny Brains. This was at a sports bar in East Hartford, Connecticut. It was Bunny Brains and Two Foot Flame. At the time, I was playing drums for the Bunny Brains. And we did a couple of shows with Two Foot Flame, with me playing drums. And I somehow summoned up the, the courage to ask Peter Jeffries if he would like to play drums with the Bunny Brains. He said, sure, I'd love to. Whoa, that easy? Really? Oh, okay, great. That freed me up to play the bass guitar, which is my weapon of choice, the Thunder Lumber. So for one night at a sports bar in East Hartford, Connecticut, the Bunny Brains had Peter Jeffries on drums and myself on bass. And it was a really surrealistic show because besides the fact that we were playing at a sports bar in East Haven, Connecticut on what I think was a Tuesday night. There was also a basketball game going on, like some kind of big deal championship playoff basketball game or something. I don't follow that stuff. But all the screens had this basketball game going on. Everybody was there to watch the basketball game. And the promoter who booked us that night to play had us play during the basketball game. And not only that, we were all dressed up in sailor suits, like official sailor uniforms. So here we are in a sports bar, kind of looking like the village people, except we're all sailors, playing this totally weird avant-garde racket that we improvised and made up. While the basketball game is going on, the sound's turned off, full of people watching the basketball game, but nobody complained. Like, nobody said a word. Nobody raised any grief. Nobody had anything to say. No one cared. They, I guess as long as they could see the basketball game, they didn't care what kind of music was going on. <coughs> and that kind of made it even more surrealistic, because really, there were very, very few people watching us play. You know, I was out there playing the bass to an audience of people looking at a TV screen over my head. They were all, like, looking... They were looking like this while I was down here. Very odd and unusual gig, but Peter Jeffries played the drums for us that night, and that was, pardon my vernacular, I'm going to say it, I, I don't like to use profanity unless I'm really making a strong point. <clears throat> so I'm going to make the strong point right now that having Peter Jeffries on drums was fucking cool. It was fucking cool. And that guy was a monster drummer. He just laid down the groove, baby. And all we had to do was lock into what he was doing. And you know what I do? I record everything. I got a killer soundboard recording of it and released it on my label, TPOS, as the Bunny Brains Hoop Soundtracks. And if you guys want to share my precious memories of that night, it's on cassette, it's on CD, it's on Discogs. This one is on Discogs. 
If you want to get it direct, talk to me. Just talk to me. I'll be happy to sell you a CD or a cassette because that's how I pay for all the cat food that Harry the cat just won't stop eating. He's a hungry man. Hungry, hungry man. Mm, mm, mm. I should mention, too, because you know what I said earlier about how it all comes back to me, right? It all comes back to me. Uh, June Brides um, shared a piece of vinyl. The second record I was ever on with my original band, Broken Talent. We actually shared a compilation EP with these guys and Sonic Youth and a really cool band from South Florida called The Chant. So it's another deal. I've got my personal memory of the June Brides. I don't really need this object. So it's up for grabs. As is the Peter Jeffries. As is... And Mondo Braswell, if you're watching, if any of you people out there appreciate the true, great American sport of professional wrestling, can I see some hearts and loves and thumbs ups and happy faces for the great sport of professional wrestling. I want to see some love for the great sport of professional wrestling. There they are. Look at those hearts and thumbs ups. Not nearly as many. Ah, there they are. Yes, yes. I don't mean sports entertainment. I mean professional wrestling. I don't do sports entertainment. I do the pro wrestle, as they say in Japan. Adam Zister is... Adam Zisser nailed it. Woo! If you're from Charlotte, you know what I'm talking about. You know what he's talking about. The great sport of professional wrestling. Who out there knows what this band, the Gentries, has to do with the great sport of professional wrestling? And even, I dare say, sports entertainment. Who do these, which of these guys, who in this band's got anything to do with the great sport of professional wrestling? Does anybody know? That's an earlier picture of them. I'll show you a later picture of them. Who's got good eyes out there? Anybody who's into professional wrestling recognize anybody in this back cover photo of the Gentries? I'll give you a hint. If you want a hint, I'll give you a hint. The hint being that you should be able to recognize them even behind the mustache. You should be able to recognize behind the mustache. And I see some comments have come in. Can anybody recognize that guy right there? That guy right there, whose nose I'm sort of tweaking? Yes. Jimmy Hart, the mouth of the South, was at one time the lead singer for the Gentries. And the Gentry's um, had a couple of albums out and a few singles, scored a couple of hits. They were apparently pretty big in Pennsylvania. I don't know why, but it seems like whenever I go record shopping or, you know, I'm, I'm in the vicinity of records for sale in Pennsylvania, for some reason I find a lot of Gentry's records, even though they were from Memphis. I don't know why it was. But yeah, this early Gentry's record on MGM and this later Gentry's record on Sun the Airsats Sun label run by Shelby Singleton from the 1970s. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, you know, in the uh, category of divestiture, I somehow ended up with two, <clears throat> not one, but two copies, <clears throat> excuse me, of this Latter-day Gentry's record. And there ain't but room for one in my house. So it's the question is, what am I going to keep? Which one am I going to keep? Am I going to keep the white label promo? Or am I going to keep... Uh-oh, never mind. I just answered my own question. The white label promo. They're both white label promos. <laughs> well, that just made it a real easy decision to make. I'm going to divest myself and put on the marketplace one of these Gentry's records. And as we've talked about before, I always keep the one that's in lesser condition. This goes back to my love of kid-conditioned comic books and 
circulated coins. I want the one I can listen to. I'm not interested in putting it in a frame or a bank vault. I want to listen to the darn thing. And I don't mind the little snap, crackle, and pop. So whichever of these two is in lesser condition, I'm going to keep, and I'm going to put the better one up for sale. So anybody wants a, a genuine, honest-to-gosh, vintage Jeffrey uh, Gentry's white label promo album from 1970-something, featuring Jimmy, Jimmy, the mouth of the South heart, talk to me. Hit me up before I put it on my Discog store. Dealing direct is a lot more fun. Gentry's, baby. It's actually good stuff, too. It's I wouldn't consider them to be like... Uh, an A-list 60s, 70s garage rock band, but they're definitely strong B. Every one of the, each of those albums has got some really, really good tracks. Fair amount of filler, but a couple of real winners on each. So it's, it's worth checking out for sure. Even if you don't like professional wrestling and you like good, solid 60s, 70s rock, Gentry's, I recommend them. I'm going to wrap up by just giving a big fat mention to a band who I love. I don't think this band gets enough love. I wish that everybody would buy every record ever made by Big Country. Not just from me, because I'm cleaning out my Big Country collection. I'm getting rid of all the duplicates and all the doubles. and Like this one, for example, I don't need it on 12-inch, regular 7-inch, and double 7-inch. I'm just keeping the regular 7-inch. That's all I need. So the 12-inch is going. And this particular one even has an original Trash American Style price tag on it with Bruce Wingate's handwriting. That's a special bonus you get if you purchase this awesome Big Country 12-inch single. I love Big Country. I think their sound was so idiosyncratic that most people didn't really get it. And as much as I love them, even I find it kind of hard to listen to a lot of their stuff in one sitting. But man, the first album... The Crossing, and all of the singles they made up to and including Wonderland. Now that's 10 out of 10. That's stuff that you just cannot beat. So don't try. Don't try it. Just don't try it. Okay. I'm glad we settled that. I'm out of here. I'm going, going, gone. Because not all of my hard-earned dollars go to feed the cat. Some of them go to feed me. And I'm going to go uh, shovel some food into my face right now. So that I, I may live another few hours. And those few hours will be devoted to stuffing devoted records into sleeves. And that's probably going to be it for tonight. Uh, maybe fielding some mail orders for Bunny Brains featuring Peter Jeffries on cassette or CD. Maybe some Profanatica orders. Who knows? And even if not, that's cool. I'm going to stay busy no matter what. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in and hearing me yip, yap, and yammer about music, about records, about comic books, about all the fun material objects that there are to enjoy on this planet of ours. It's a good planet. I like being here. I like the stuff on it. And I'm glad that you folks join me every single Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for Tent Talks Tunes. Waka! So I do hope to be back in about 167 hours time. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>